Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Welcome back to America's Heroes Group. This time with a roundtable community outreach with NADCP, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. September is National Suicide Prevention and Hispanic Heritage Month. Today is Saturday, September 24th, 2022. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega, Scouts Honor Productions. And we have a panelist today. He's got a unique individual and someone that you're going to have a story that you will remember for a, a time to come. He's a U.S. Marine Corps Purple Heart. Can't expect anything less from the U.S. Marines. Recipient, combat veteran, and the program director for the uh, Bucum County Veterans Treatment Court in Asheville, North Carolina. We're going to talk about the North Carolina Bucum County Veteran Treatment Court and his personal experience. And we're going to particularly pay some attention to the human connection and also the things he's been working on in his in his life and his career. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. It's our pleasure. So tell us your story. So you have had some experiences. You've hit you've been hit with some might say rock bottom, been to that that those places. Tell us about that and how you got your life turned around and get to where you are today. Yeah, my story is definitely not unique. Um, I went into the Marine Corps right out of high school. My father served, my grandfather served, and um, I was really, really proud to uh, go to Paris Island. I was an infantry member, ended up going to 3-7 Lima Company in 29 Palms. We go to the Syrian border, this is 2003, mm. and we ended up losing 26 Marines wow. out there to buy the explosive device. Um, and I was hit by an IED April 7th of 2004, and the shrapnel went through my body, through my legs, through my arms, uh, shrapnel in my left eye, and yeah, I knew I was going to die. I knew right then and there that I was dying. I could hear my other uh, Marine screaming, PFC Vega, and uh, my best friend Chris Wasser, you know, half of his head was missing. So here I am dying, and I remember the corpsman came running up to me and uh, shot me up with morphine. He shot me up twice. Mm. And in that moment, when I had such a feeling of terror, I don't know, or just this sense of serenity came over me, and I had no idea that would, that would be the beginning of this long struggle with opioids, with addiction. But here in my worst moment, dying on the Syrian border, um, a sense of peace came over. So I... Like many uh, veterans, I get airlifted, go to Germany, then sent to Walter Reed, have 32 surgeries, and a doctor tells me, Kevin, you're never going to walk again. Mm. Bad, we're probably going to have to amputate both legs. Um, but throughout that uh, year and a half, I still had opioids. And it was just this calming of the trauma experience and the separation from my tribe and my community. And I'm stateside while they're still over there. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I really, really struggled. I didn't have a sense of purpose anymore. Didn't have a sense of identity. And, um, yeah, this is really what I see every day working with uh, the veteran community here is the Marine Corps gave us so much. And it was this calling that was greater than myself. And then my transition out of it, um, mine was unique because I was airlifted out. But even veterans that just um, EAS out, you know, they may have a PowerPoint presentation about what's it like in the real world. <laughs> and good luck. I didn't even get the PowerPoint presentation. But uh, so, yeah, I found myself struggling. Um, I lost everything and everyone I loved because of my addiction. Mm. It didn't matter how much I um, loved my friends and family, how much I wanted to keep a stable job, do all these things that um, meant the world to me. My addiction was stronger. And uh, I wish I could tell you it was just a linear journey to recovery, but uh, we know that's not the case. I had a lot of ups and downs. I found myself in the hospital. I was involuntarily committed. Mm -hmm. I arrested, so I was justice involved, all of these different things. And I also tried recovery. But what I arrived at was that I couldn't live without drugs, and I couldn't live with them. Mm -hmm. And so really everything was just a slow suicide. I didn't have the courage to just kill myself, but I did not know how to live. Um, but I reached a place where I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I threw my hands up, and that was, you know, maybe my 10th bottom, 10th time going inpatient. Mm. And 
Um, one day at a time, here I am 11 years later, and I have a renewed sense of hope and a renewed sense of purpose. And a big part of that is giving back to the veterans that are struggling like I was when I first got out and those veterans that are finding themselves in the legal system and may believe they have no hope and uh, may wish to die. So I can't say it's just one thing that was the Mm cure-all. I did get on medication for opioid use disorder that really helped me out, Suboxone specifically. That medication kind of quelled the, the every cell in my body screaming that I need heroin and fentanyl. Um, but that was just the foundation. Then I got to begin the, the real work, which is, you know, the psychological healing. Mm. And here I am now working with the Veterans Treatment Court in Buncombe County. Wow. So when you go through that, that pain, I've heard somebody tell me one time that the pain of when people go to, to drug court or treatment court or – any kind of uh, abuse court, it's the pain that they're going through is not a pain of necessarily, it's not just a pain of addiction, but it's a psychological pain. There's a, hurt, there's a hurt, an emotional pain that's really at the core of everything. And until that pain is actually treated, you can treat the drugs, you can treat you know the, the physical pain all you want, but until you treat that, that inner hurt in your soul, you're not really making much progress. Is that right? Yeah, that is that's so true. And I've been with the Veterans Treatment Court for since uh, 2016. And that is exactly what I'm seeing. Really, addiction is a symptom. But the suffering, the underlying suffering um, is what we're trying to work at. And that a lot of times is um, that's the trauma experience. But if we talk about trauma and what is trauma, uh, there's this author, Bessel van der Kolk, And he describes trauma in an interesting way. He says trauma is our inability to self-regulate the body because we're these amazing machines designed to keep ourselves alive. He says it's our trauma is our inability to self-regulate and our inability to generate meaningful relationships. And when you say, you know, addiction is one part of it, but we got deeper, I'm seeing... Um, how do we make healthy attachments with other human beings? Mm -hmm. How can I uh, have a healthy relationship with myself? Uh, So, yeah, there's interesting science behind this. There's interesting, uh, uh, the neuroscience is proving what I think you and I also feel just within our soul and our heart is we, we need to connect with other humans on a, full level, a meaningful level, and have a meaningful sense of purpose. And there's a quote by uh, Sebastian Younger, and he says, well, you know, our military members, they're willing to go off and fight the war, but while they're willing to die for this country, they return home to find they're not sure how to live for it. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of resonates with what we're doing. We're not just treating addiction, okay, don't use heroin anymore, don't use cocaine, but how can we empower these veterans to have healthy, meaningful lives? Wow. The one thing I noticed about reading, they're doing the research on, on treatment courts, is that the success rate is way higher through treatment court. The recidivism is like very low compared to the regular civilian justice system. So giving someone a choice or giving someone the option to say, hey, we're going to put you in a treatment program that's not just, you know, seeing a counselor or whatever, but going through the hard task of really getting down to the bottom of getting you off of these drugs, getting to the core root problem, the real general hurt that was inside of you. If you take that path, a, it, like they, it was a, uh, there was a, in New Hampshire, there was a, a judge that talked about some statistics, and she said that in her district, it would cost about $30,000 to put somebody through the regular criminal court system. It cost $8,000 to put someone through treatment court. The success rate of the of regular ju- the justice system is something like 30%. And you're spending $30,000 yeah. to get 30%. 78% success rate in treatment court. Right. <laughs> and you, this is New Hampshire. This is, these are real numbers, real facts. So tell me, so, you know, from your experience, what are some of the breakthroughs that you're, that you're discovering through treatment court that it's not being addressed in the civilian justice system? Yeah, that's a good question. The uh, 
the teams on these diversion courts, be it Veterans Treatment Court, Adult Drug Treatment Court, Mental Health, uh, Sobriety Court, DUI Court, they make up, they're made up by prosecutors, public defenders, community mental health teams, the judge. Uh, our team here in Asheville has got, uh, you know, about 12 people on the team, and they all have unique skills. And I was talking to our prosecutor, and he said, you know, this is my favorite thing about coming to work is doing the Veterans Treatment Court and doing Adult Drug Treatment Court because I get to know the clients as human beings. And the design of our present uh, legal system doesn't allow that. It removes the humanity, the dignity, and just makes it very, very, this is the charge. It is cut and dry. Um, And so anytime that we can put the human back in, and then you highlighted it. We know simple incarceration doesn't work. After nine years, I think the Department of Justice showed uh, nine years after exiting the prison system, 83% of people are going to return. Mm. And that's just, yeah, clearly it's not working. This is not sustainable. And part of it, we know that our justice system is the oldest form of white supremacy and maintaining white supremacy. These are antiquated systems, and we are looking at the outcomes that we're getting, and it's no one is surprised. This is a system that was designed to perpetuate inequality and maintain the status quo. And so we are uh, really honored to say, hey, all right, we want to try something different. We want to try something different that focuses on treatment and accountability, because treatment alone is really amazing, depending on the risks and the needs of the population. But the accountability element, especially for our veteran population, that's when they thrive because uh, veterans are used to that structure. They're used to having the team dynamic, um, even the hierarchy of all these things. So, um, yeah, I think ultimately we're seeing the consequences of the system working as it was designed to work. Mm. Now, you're a licensed clinical social worker. So when you meet with people, being a veteran and also having been there, done that, with abuse and things along those lines, haven't gone through that same pain. How do people relate to you versus someone who has not experienced that? And is that is, do you think that's a prerequisite in these cases to help people really get to that level? Well, I have noticed that being a veteran is in itself an intervention. We talk about this in uh, de-escalation and crisis training, that if uh, law enforcement has a officer who served and maybe you're interacting with um, a veteran, just veterans talking to veterans can de-escalate and really, um, yeah, connect and build rapport instantly. When I see a Marine that walks in my room I've never met, and I say Semper Fi, Devil Dog, instantly their guard is, you know, drops a little bit, and we can connect on a meaningful level. Now, as a licensed clinical social worker, I believe all humans can connect with others, regardless of our different lived experience. Um, I'll say, personally, I actually like uh, the therapists that were not veterans. Mm. And the reason why is because uh, they wanted to know what was the experience. They have no idea what it means to be in war. And so um, now that I am a licensed therapist, I have to remember this beginner's mindset where I and not impose my experience on every vet I meet. And I almost have to um, make this daily recommitment. My story is not their story. Tell me more. What does that mean to you? What does that feel like? What does that look like? How does it show up in your life? Um, because it'd be too easy for me, for a Marine to walk in, I say, hey, Devil Dog, good to see you. Oh, don't even tell me anymore. I already know your story. Around and, you know, we know each other. So, yeah, in some ways, to answer your question, I think it's, um, it doesn't make a difference. There are strengths. There are pros and cons. Um, for me, and I started this job, I think it was, I was not yet a licensed social worker. I hadn't gone to graduate school, and it was just doing it um, because I, I saw working with veterans, we had this bond, and it was a really, really cool thing. I started as a mentor, 
And I don't know if uh, anyone's discussed kind of the mentor dynamic in veterans courts with you. A little bit, but go through that because that's really important, I think. And I think that's one of the key differences between your success or failure. It reminds me of like an AA type experience when you have like a support group around you to help you, help you get through. And another key thing to talk about this is not done in prison. Because one of the arguments, because um, we have a culture that likes to punish. You know, we're in the punishment culture. <laughs> we're like, we want justice and punishment versus treatment and solutions. But the thing of it is, is that it's not done in a prison system. So letting people back go back home and cope in real world situations versus being in a closed and controlled environment. So talk about that. Yeah. And we, as a nation, we love that. We love to proclaim, hey, we are about justice mm-hmm. it's called the justice <laughs> it's more appropriate to call it the legal system uh, justice can sometimes be evasive and elusive but what we have found and evidence supports this for this population who have dual diagnosis they have trauma they have addiction then the environment that they're in everything is interconnected we are not operating as human beings as silos um, so to learn these skills in a structured environment is very important and that is well and good but if you cannot put them into action to practice them in society uh, nothing really changes and so we want to empower our veterans and a mentor is part of that same as you were saying as a sponsor the mentor walks alongside this veteran as a battle buddy and they're not their pastor They're not their uh, banker. They're not their counselor, problem solver. They're almost a a mirror. And the mentor is always bouncing back. Tell me, what would what would you do in this situation? And this is I started as a mentor, Mm -hmm. and I just had assigned one veteran, and I went through the NADCP boot camp, the Justice for Vets boot camp. It was in D.C. a week long, and I remember the training. And it's just uh, simple things, active listening. You know, I would have this veteran call me. It would be a Friday. And then our veterans are on curfew in the beginning of the program. And he'd call and he'd say, hey, Kevin, you know, I just uh, I want to go on this date tonight. I want to go to the movies. You know, I was thinking about going to this movie at 11 o'clock tonight. What do you think? Uh, what do you think? And obviously I have an opinion, but I would bounce it back to the veteran. I'd say, well, man, you know, that's great to hear you're making uh, these healthy connections. Well, I know you got to talk to the judge on Friday. you got veterans court. What do you think the judge will say? And I'm just mirror back, right, because these are these veterans' decisions, and ultimately their decisions are what led them to the legal system. And then he'd be like, oh, you got me, Kevin. You're right. All right, we don't want to do that. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble with the judge. But these were the real-world situations and they get to live them out to practice new people new places and new things that is what we have to change and the judge when any veteran enters the court he says you know this is an easy program the only thing that i need from you as a veteran is you have to show up you have to be honest and you have to try and if you can do those three things not only are you going to be able to make it through this but you're going to transform your life and that transformation can't happen behind prison walls like it does when we're in the community. So we get to see veterans who entered our court, no contact with uh, maybe their kids and their wife or their family members. They don't have a stable job. They have no housing. All of these pressures are on them, unaddressed mental health and trauma. They graduate 18 months later for our program. Uh, We just had a graduate. And this is who I'm thinking of when I'm sharing this. He now has transportation. He now is reunited with his four-year-old son. He has service-connected disability, which he had never thought to pursue in his entire life. He now has VA health care, a substance use team at the VA. He reunited with his mother. And he's in a poetry class. And he now does this journey. And he did equine therapy. But you talk to him, and who he is now, he has a sense of purpose and something bigger than himself, which for him is being a father. But he could never have achieved that if we were just behind in a prison wall saying, this is what it means to be a dad. <laughs> you know, 
happen to show up as a father. Wow. So what happens when somebody falls off the wagon? Is there is there is there a, a second chance or how does that part of it work? Because I know that's going to be a struggle. When we're dealing with people with addiction, they're going to fall off the wagon at some point. How does that process unfold? Yeah, and this is built into the design of diversion courts. Um, same as my story. I went in 10 times before it finally took hold. Um, and there's there is not a single number, like five times is how many times we've given before they're removed from program. Um, for every unwanted behavior, we will have a response. And for every positive behavior, we will celebrate that. Mm. At its core, it's this uh, conditioning. And we are helping the veterans to condition themselves to new behavior. So when they have a return to use and they struggle, we don't shame them. We don't belittle them. Uh, it's not a moral shortcoming. Instead, what we do is try to support them with more treatment. And we work with the clinical staff to identify, all right, if this veteran is receiving A, B, and C treatment, and they're still struggling, clearly they need a higher level of care. And there's uh, standardized assessments that they use in the ASAM and all that. But we are never going to terminate anyone from our court if they are showing up being honest and trying wow. and you can do all three of those and return to use mm. um but we we have seen veterans that just continue um, and are unable to change and could be unable to change in their environment and they were in our program maybe a year and a half and just were not making the change that we need to see and so they were uh, terminated from our court. But even if a veteran is terminated from the court, and I love sharing this with stakeholders, even if they're terminated, we are still seeing that as a success because they're connected to health care. They have a new support system. They have perhaps service connection. They have a recovery community because they have to be engaged in some type of community-based recovery and treatment. Um, so they have all of that. And then we will take them back into the veterans court all we need is 12 months to elapse. So if they have a new charge, we'll take this veteran back into our program and try again. And we have a veteran who is on track to graduate right now, who three years ago he came in our court, was not, it just wasn't clicking. But he, so he's terminated, here he is back in our program and he's about to graduate. And when I asked him, you know, what's kind of what was the, the secret? He mm -hmm. said, I just wasn't ready to change. Wow. And no veterans court or anything could do that for me. So even if they're unsuccessful, we see there are benefits, and then we'll take them back a year later if it's appropriate. Wow. So if, if someone does fall off the wagon or gets kicked out of the program, do they have to then uh, serve their original sentence? Is there some kind of court punishment for that? or? Yeah, so and every veteran's uh, order – what the judge uh, sentences them to is unique. There, in North Carolina, we have new statutes that limit the, um, like a veteran will never enter into a court and then have to go serve their original punishment. Okay. There are uh, caps. The judge will also take into account their length of time in the court. So some veterans, after this whole experience, may just go and serve 30 days, uh, or they may do 60 um, there's a lot of factors that I probably shouldn't even speak on because I'm not an attorney, mm -hmm. but from a social work perspective, I've advocated, I never want to punish someone for the disease of addiction. And if it's, that's the reason they were terminated, um, then we should do everything we can to make sure we're not just compounding time, adding two years plus do your original sentence. That makes no sense to me. Um, but yeah, it's not a uh, uniform across the board. Mm. Do you see from your experience from the time from the time that you had you dealt with these issues and or was able to get salvation, if if you will, if you if we can use that word, is if, have you seen a change and a shift in our culture and our and our mindset of how we view people with addiction? Is it becoming more accepted that people that it is a disease and that we do need to treat this as opposed to punish this? Is that is that 
idea starting to saturate into the mindset of the people? I think so. I think it is taking hold. I think we are beginning to understand it is a disease. You know, the one disease where your neighbor doesn't come over and drop off a cake and wish you the best. (laughs) You don't get those uh, good wishes cards. But um, because addiction impacts everyone, I think um, my experience, everyone is impacted in some way or touched by addiction that we can't ignore it anymore. And we have to face it. I do think there's, um, yeah, there's disparities even to kind of our national compassion towards those suffering from addiction. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, not to get too tangential, but we were looking at outcomes even of diversion courts and individuals who are most successful. And we see there are uh, racial disparities at play. And one of the biggest reasons, because uh, white individuals are more likely to graduate than individuals of color. And what we found was um, it wasn't because of procedural justice or even um, treatment by individuals of color, by law enforcement or probation. It was a lack of culturally competent or culturally congruent treatment providers. Mm. There is a shortage of treatment providers of color. There's also a shortage of evidence-based interventions for uh, specifically men of color that are addicted to cocaine. And just, I shared my story in the beginning with you. When I got into the hospital um, and really achieved success, I was given Suboxone. They don't have a Suboxone cocaine. What was that? You said what? You don't have a what? So I was given a medication for my disease called okay. Suboxone. Okay, I heard of that. But there's no federally approved medication yet to treat cocaine. There are off-label wow. medications, but there's nothing for cocaine. And so it's just a disparity where we're moving forward on. But um, to answer your question, I, I do see a, a change nationally, but we still have a lot of work to do. Kevin Rumley, U.S. Marine Corps Purple Heart recipient, combat veteran, and program director for the Bucumbi County Veterans Treatment Court in Asheville, North Carolina. You have a great story. Look forward to the book that's <laughs> coming out <laughs> when you ready to get around to writing it. <laughs> and also, we got to come back on our show. We got to come back and see you sometime. We appreciate you. I would love that. It's been a real joy. My pleasure. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back. <laughs> 